Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming into an extra session during your lunchtime. I really appreciate that. So my name is Jeremy Luch. I'm a professor at IDS, the Institute of Development Studies. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce a new project. So it's basically a launch of a new project that's entitled The Great Green Wall, Pan-African Imaginaries to Fight Against Desertif Desertification. So as you can see, it fits really well with the thematic focus of the ECAS conference on African futures. Um, so as a, as a sort of French British br based in a British institution, I'm happy that I can still uh, be involved <laughs> in a European collaboration through the um, open research area for the social sciences, um, where uh, as a British university we can still contribute into uh, collaborating with our European friends. Okay, so the uh, presentation of today is as follows. I'm just going to give you a bit of background for those that don't know about the Great Green Wall Project. Um, Great Lef will explain the research design and the sort of conceptual contribution that we would like to make with our project. Um, and then we'll go briefly through the situation in Ethiopia and Senegal and then go through some sort of open questions and contribution because uh, we're really looking for some comments as we're just starting the project and it would be nice to hear from your perspective if you've worked in some of these countries link linked to the Great Green Wall or uh, if there are problematics essentially around political ecology that you're interested that in, you've been working with that you can also share with us. Okay, so um, let me basically um, talk about the Great Green Wall. I mean, in terms of uh, sort of African futures and imaginaries, it's quite fantastic. This idea of, if you like, this green belt that cuts across Africa all along the Sahel. So from Senegal, and it goes up to uh, even Djibouti. Um, and, and the idea, essentially, um, is to fight uh, against the desertification and around land restoration and reforestation. Um, these statistics are interesting because they can be a bit confusing. They sh show the share of total restored land. You can see that uh, the major country uh, investing in this effort is mostly Ethiopia, with more than 55, 57% of the total restored land, followed by Niger uh, and a few others. However, this, 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 this statistic sorry, is confusing because it doesn't cover just the Great, great War area, but covers the whole of the countries. So in some ways, it, it, it's a bit misleading. Um, um, and in some ways, one of the most vocal countries uh, really behind the Great Green War has been Senegal, and they have been doing quite a lot around the Great Green War. Um, but what's quite fantastic is that the project uh, aims to cover more than 8,000 8, kilometers, um, a sort of large corridor that cuts across. And this very much, very, very much when you think of it, this sort of imaginary line, uh, and, and that's the way it's represented. Of course, in reality, it's much more dotted. <laughs> it's not this clear line that cuts across. But it is very much part of this imaginary that is sort of vehicled around. And what is also interesting about the Great Green Wall is the sort of, I would say, even the sort of marketing side, the sort of normative side to it. There's a sort of marketing bashing about it by a lot of agencies. Uh, so that's from uh, UNEP, the United in Environmental Program, uh, that with this title, the Great Green Wall is the wall we need. What's interesting is also the sort of tenses. It's also about projection. It's about the future. While the Great Green Wall actually has started a long time ago. Uh, or perhaps not. That's also one of the sort of intriguing questions that we have uh, behind. So just a bit of history for, for those of you that haven't heard about uh, the Great Green Wall. It is very important to put it in, in, in a historical perspective. Um, ideas to a forest and re revisit, revisitate, sorry, that's my French site coming out, uh, the Africa, African dry land has been really dating back to the colonial period. Um, you can go back to sort of the French col uh, colonial forestry office trying to 
uh, think about uh, the sort of revegetation of, of, of dry land and, and deserts as, in some ways as, as the evil. Um, but the idea in its modern sense, if you like, really took shape in 2005. Um, it was um, launched at the uh, seventh uh, summit of the leaders and heads of the state of the community of Sahel, Sahel State. Um, it was very much the sort of, uh, president of Nigeria that launched the idea, but the president of Senegal, the former president of Senegal, Abdoulaye Wad, was very uh, sort of keen influential figure in, in, in the relaunch of this idea. So it's quite old, you know, dating back to 2005, but it has taken a, a considerably new political dynamic. Uh, obviously there you can see the French president uh, below there, Macron, at the One Planet Summit for Biodiversity uh, in 2021. And it has taken a really new form uh, because there were large commitments that were done at the summit, giving a completely new, configura new political configuration around the project. Uh, more than $16 billion were announced um, and committed for, the well, committed for the next five years over the idea of the Great Green Wall. What does it really mean in practice? What does this money really mean? And whether it's already part of other projects, that's another problematic. But in some ways, it, it shows why there's a sort of reinvigoration of, of, of the project. And in some ways, that, that highlights already one of the potential tensions if you like, uh, around the Great Green Wall, which is very much um, uh, 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 what started very much, um, so there I'm showing you sort of different framings and understanding of what the purpose of this Great Green Wall. Very much started as a sort of pan-African initiative from the uh, sort of early 1990s uh, around you essentially seeing the Great Green Wall as a way to change the image of Africa in some ways, well, for some of the leaders and the people that were behind it, uh, to try and think of it as a green, fertile, and prosperous Africa. That's the way it was very much portrayed uh, from a pan-African perspective, at least from the leaders uh, in the region. I think it's also gradually changing because in some ways now, uh, other actors are coming in from France and, uh, and the global north, where there, now there's this notion of acceleration uh, the idea that the Great Green Wall is not happening quickly enough. And um, uh, uh, is the idea of, obviously, more funds, more money is going to change completely the landscape. So that's, that's a, another potential framing, not to see uh, the Great Green Wall as a sort of pan-African initiative, but essentially as a development project, as a development project where more technical expertise and more money is going to change completely the landscape. Obviously, there's an other perspective. From a UNEP perspective, it's essentially about restore, restoring the African degraded farmland. So there, we are very much uh, entering the debates around sort of political ecology, <coughs> reforestation, uh, green transformation, and, and so on. For, the, for other actors, like the World Bank, uh, the Great Green Wall is essentially seen as a green corridor um, uh, of growth. Um, there was, uh, two weeks ago, a session at the European Parliament, a great, the Grand Green Wall, and they were talking about the Great Green Wall as a big infrastructure corridor. Um, so it's not just in terms of road, obviously, but it's about the, the connection of, of nature, of water, and so on. So there's this idea of corridor now that is emerging in terms of, sort of infrastructural type of language. And again, obviously, what's also interesting if you look at the, the, the Great Green Wall and the map is that you'll see that most countries that it cuts across in the Sahel are going through conflict dynamics, um, as we all know. And in some ways, some security specialists are start seeing the Great Green Wall as potentially as a sort of counterinsurgency type of method to fight radicalization. Um, and hence, that, that sort of also brings me to the sort of choices of different case study. Um, because what's interesting also, because of the political economy of the Great Green Wall, what's, what's changing is the sort of spatial dynamics. So, as I said, initially it was very much the Sahel, uh, so from Senegal to Djibouti, but now it's expanding, potentially linked to the political economy of, of donors and financing. And what's quite interesting is obviously the Great Green Wall project 
in the middle there's not much happening because of these conflict dynamics and there's a questioning about whether this project is working or not and people now are starting about expanding the idea of the Great Green Wall. So now there are countries at the periphery that are applying for the Great Green Wall. So you got Ivory Coast, uh, you had Togo and Benin that are applying and that are nearly uh, potentially part of the Great Green Wall which completely changes the dynamic but it's even stranger than that there's now countries like Somalia or there's country like Madagascar that are even being thought about and discussed about the Great Green Wall. So this sort of initial uh, sort of need project initially that was cutting across in now, is now being scattered uh, all, all over Africa in some ways. So that, 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 that was uh, from my perspective and I'm going to hand over now to Detlef to uh, discuss about um, the um, conceptual uh, underpinning of our project. So I'm, I'm Detlef Milaman, University of Bonn, and I just want to say a few things um, about what we are intending to do in this project and also why we're meeting here, and I'm, I'm very glad there's so many people in the room. So this is meant as an invitation to our colleagues, whoever is working on, on related issues, please keep in touch or get in touch with us. Uh, we are just starting and we're very much interested in, in collaborating with you on this project. So the first question uh, we are starting with, how can a wall be a connection? Because the image behind um, this big project is uh, the idea of connecting countries, these 11 uh, participating countries between Senegal and Ethiopia, Djibouti, on the other side of the continent. How can a wall be a connection? How can a project that says it, it intends to fight desertification uh, combine its goals with, with um, more or less openly expressed goals of also fighting against um, Islamic insurgency and destabilization in the wider region. Um, and we started uh, this project um, just two months ago with, with a workshop in Senegal where we first had um, a symposium in Dakar, so I'm very glad that some of our colleagues here, here Abdullah, uh, who was also at that conference, uh, where uh, researchers um, who were taking part in this OHMI um, project presented their findings that they have generated over the past couple of years. So there was a tremendous amount of uh, findings and publications with a focus primarily on this human environment interface and a lot of contributions, especially from the natural sciences. And then afterwards we traveled to a research station uh, close to the border of Mauritania uh, together with um, uh, officials and administrators and politicians who are responsible um, for uh, implementing the Great Green Wall in the wider region, uh, representatives of all 11 participating countries, not 11 but um, uh, I think Eritrea always uh, stays absent but all the others were there. So it was very interesting for two reasons. So the first reason you see in this picture here on the left, um, there's signs all over the region. Now you're entering the Great Green Wall. And what you do see is trees. But when you pass by, I'm not an ecologist, but I'm, I'm just a human geographer, I wonder whether well, these trees, they look a bit older than uh, 11 years. So what do these trees actually have to do with the Great Green Wall? Haven't they always been there? So what is new about the Great Green Wall? That was the first question I was, uh, or we were asking. And then secondly, um, that's the picture on the right, we were meeting there in a seminar room in, in the research station in Waidu, and we presented our um, project idea where we uh, made a point that we wanted to revisit uh, the project of the Great Green Wall from a different perspective. So we're not repeating what all these others have done, but our focus is on the imagination behind the Great Green Wall. So our focus is on uh, this political project as an imaginaire, something that cuts across the African continent where it's not necessarily visible on the ground. And the reaction was very interesting uh, uh, from the participants. On the one hand, the scientists, and then on the other hand, um, the development practitioners and politicians. Our colleagues, the scientists, said, are you crazy? The Great Green Wall is not an imaginaire. It's happening. It is a reality. 
And then the politician says, well, yeah, you're completely right. It is an imagination. Uh, so go ahead. And I mean, for us, um, it was interesting. I think we will be able to convince our colleagues uh, in the sciences over the coming two or three years while we're working there. But the important thing is that we got the endorsement from the side of the politicians and, and the ones who are responsible for the project. Because they say, yes, we need to understand how an imagination of a project drives activities on the ground. And that's very briefly what I want to um, explain in the following three or four slides. So we're linking up to the activities of this um, French uh, Senegalese and cross-country uh, project OHM, uh, o, uh, no, uh, OH, no, him, OHMI, um, Tessekere, with plenty of publication and a focus on human populations, plants, animals, biotopes with the typically uh, we would say a multidisciplinary um, um, approach and four thematic areas covering health, biodiversity, social systems and water and soils. So we would probably formulate these things differently and we personally I don't like the systems approach too much because it, it somehow implies that everything is related to everything um, but one better needs to understand what is actually driving uh, changes. And that's behind the approach we are taking because we are, st we are starting with three hypotheses that are already in the title of uh, our project approach. So the, the project that got approved by the funding agencies in Germany, uh, the UK and France, the title is The Great Green Wall and Sahelian Environmental Imaginaries, Green Fix, and the persistence of a policy idea. And these three catchwords in the title, um, these are the hypotheses we are starting with. The so first of all, we are trying to understand the Great Green uh, Wall as an imaginary, something that is imagined, a vision that is behind it, a vision that can be sold, a vision that stands for desirable futures, but one has to ask the desirable futures of whom and for whom these futures are uh, formulated. And we're trying to understand how these visions of desirable futures are projected into space. So the Great Green Wall basically is a line, a green line on a map of Africa. But this does not necessarily mean that it is also happening on the ground as it is on the map. That's, that's the idea behind an imaginary. Secondly we would conceive of the Great Green Wall as a green fix approach. There's the idea behind it that reforestation and the appropriate use of technologies and scientific knowledge may help to implement this project. This is what drives development projects on the ground uh, based on the experience people have made for decades in reforestation. There's nothing new about that. But still there is this tendency to use this um, project that is financed by billions of euros to use it as a, as a technical green fix for problems that are not only environmental problems, but problems go far beyond the environment. And it's, it's, not, only, um, it's not sufficient to only look at human environment uh, interactions, but we need to understand the political background behind what is happening here. And that is the the third um, hypothesis that we are investigating, it is about the question how um, this kind of policy ideas become stabilized in political discourse. So as soon as something like such a big project is in the debates, it doesn't vanish from one day to the other, but it has some tendency to remain over a long period of time. And that's what we have just observed at this conference uh, mentioned by Jeremy um, less than two weeks ago where um, the French uh, Minister of Development Cooperation insisted that France is contributing, is making a major contribution to stopping the expansion of the desert and at the same time they're also stopping uh, the expansion of Islamic um, insurgency. So um, this policy um, idea behind it has a, has a tendency to remain in place and to unfold a power that we try to understand. We do so with a project design um, 
that has two cornerstones. First of all, we are looking at green transformations and a technical green fix in relation to an approach we are also using in other contexts by studying um, how traveling models or traveling ideas get locally appropriated and adopted by local populations, policy makers and others. And secondly, uh, in our empirical research, uh, we are focusing especially on the local response and the local perspec per, um, perspective of people who are living with this project that is being implemented somehow beyond their heads. And Ellie is now going to explain how we want to um, conduct that project and which empirical approach we are choosing. So one of the three main objectives of the project is to understand how the development of new imaginaries around the Great Green Wall can consider vernacular practices and help its decolonization. So to address this objective, this objective the project plans to set up a traveling workshop in three countries on the route of the Great Green Wall, Senegal, Ethiopia, and Burkina Faso. And according to this traveling workshop, I propose three research questions that still need to be refined and reformulated according to your suggestions. So first, how, to what extent the Great Green Wall, considered as a boundary object, can promote vernacular knowledge and local practices? Secondly, still according to this prospective approach, how are the relationship between humans and the, the Great Green Wall, being the forest or the trees, for example, are thought of, and according to which narratives? For example, desirable futures, feared futures, and certainty. And finally, how the development of new imaginaries can promote the formulation of landscape strategies that aligns with just desirable and decolonial futures. During the traveling workshop, so there will be basic information provided to the participants, for example, past and, and, uh, and uh, present uh, wildlife species or vegetation species, the history of the area, climate change, things like this. And there will be, as well, participatory methodologies in order to foster collaboration. So, for example, a collaborative timeline in order to gather a temporalized relationship with the environment. That's a methodology that I used during my PhD in South Africa and it was very interesting to, to, to mobilize. It could be an opportunity as well for participants to exhibit drawings, photographies, or paintings about um, the Great Green Wall and the future related to this idea, so artistic <coughs> production, and also a community voice methodology, which is a short documentary movie realized by the participants, structured with semi-directed interviews that would allow the dialogue and communication between the different sites in the project and while allowing to identify the local specificities, which is very interesting because it's an African project, but a global project, a pan-African project. And it will be this Participatory methodologies will, will be accompanied by an in-depth archive work about medias, artists, or documents of the African Union, for example. So, as previously mentioned, the three countries will be considered, so especially Senegal and Ethiopia, and I'm going to present you briefly the Senegalese site. So, the concrete implementation of the Great Green Wall in Senegal occurred in 2008, and covers 80,000 hectares on 535 kilometers. It encompasses 30 rural communities, including Tesekere, which is a territory studied by the Human Milieu Observatory. So the, the site is dominated by pastoral activity in steppe and savanna environments, which are particularly subject to desertification leading to a breakdown in the agro-pastoral system. So with an increase in the nomadic lifestyle, a shift from small herds of big cattle to uh, large herds of small ruminants, and the abandonment of wintering agriculture. So we can see here that the social and ecological issues are intertwined. That's why the project in Senegal focuses on two main axes that are interrelated in practice. So reforestation, 
and poverty elevation and food security, so a development project. So the reforestation project started with a selection of five tree species. So Acacia Senegal, Balanites Egyptiaca, Acacia radiana, Zizifus mauritana, and Tamarindus indica that are particularly adapted to the, Sahelia, to the dry Sahelian climate. But not only, because the species are also intended to be used by the local communities. For example, here we can see straw collection and sale, the development of nurseries for tree planting, uh, the sale of fruits and other products coming from the trees, and also the development of beehives. So the species can just be used for food construction, health, craft, energy, trade, or industry. So huge variety of uses. So actions conducted within this project are not just symptomatic, but aim to profoundly change the dynamic of the social ecological system. So maybe from sustainability to transformativity. And now Matthias is going to present you the Ethiopian site. Hello, my name is Matthias. I'm from Ethiopia. Welcome to our presentation again. I'm not going to talk too much because already mentioned, I'm just only focused on Ethiopia. As mentioned above, Ethiopia is one of the countries that has taken a step to implement Great Green Wall project since 2011, and especially with the, with the related goal of uh, uh, Great Green Wall project, environmental degradation, promote sustainable development, and the great green wall activity have been put into action in the northern part of the country. As you see from the, the area, it just comes from Sudan and crossing three regions, Amhara, Tigray, and Upper region in the north of the, the, the country. And then it will cover around 13.2 million hectares across these three regions. And then it's, it's already um, implemented some action, for example, with different NGOs, for example, with action against desertification from 2016 to 2020. As a pilot test in the area of, for example, Metama from Amhara region, Golina from uh, Afar, and Rayazabo from, from uh, Afar region. So in general, around 50 million hectares have been restarted from the Great Greenwall project. Among these, around 56% have been achieved by Ethiopian government. Of course, sorry, um, there is no doubt a lot of activities have been done by Ethiopian government. In, uh, to do so, there are a lot of um, strategies have been uh, designed. For example, uh, climate resilient green economy, and sustainable land management. And also in 2017, in 2019, uh, the Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed launched the Green, Green Legacy Initiative as a part of uh, initiative of uh, to plant 2020 uh, billion trees in 2016. So in the same year, in July 2019, more than 300 million trees are planted in just over 12 hours. And then, of course, there's a record uh, breaking a ton and is still planted every year. So, however, uh, these are uh, criticized by a lot of uh, foresters and the research institute because it's not mostly institutionalized and most of the time this institution also reshuffled here and there. And the other one is top-down approach. Most of the time, these tree planting initiatives driven by states and less uh, local community involvement. On the other hand, it's run by politicians, and it's being used explo exploit as a political tool from local to national level. And an unclear benefit sharing, and also no information about what tree to be planted already rather than planting every year. And my <coughs> our research consider of not only Great Green World Project, of course, in the north part, and also seeing what's going on regreening as a Great Green <coughs> Legacy Initiative in total. Of course, in the past three years, these regions, these three regions, Amhara, Tigray, and Afar region were in the war zone. So I doubt that there is no 
uh, tree planting activities in this three region. So what I'm thinking is, uh, in general, tree planting activi activities are counted for Great Greenwall project in the country. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attendance. Very much appreciated. And see you around. Thank you.